Gordors, welcome back to AP Bio with Miss Gorder. As you can see, it's crazy hair day, crazy headwear day. This is in the middle of 2020. The coronavirus pandemic is when I film this. So trying to brighten the mood, right? Um, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe below, right? Um, and without further ado, we're going to get started. So this section, uh, chapter 22, is on the origin of species. So we've talked a little bit about different mechanisms of evolution, and today we're going to get into how we actually get new species out of this. So um, as you recall, Darwin, when he's visiting the Galapagos Islands, he um, realized that there were many plants and animals on these islands that were not found anywhere else on Earth. So where could this come from? Um, and we now have kind of a study of this um, idea, which is called speciation. This is the process by which we have one species that ends up turning into two or more species. And so um, speciation helps explain the idea of descent with modification because many species share features due to a recent common ancestor. But we have to ask ourselves, what is the point where we now have a completely new species? Um, this kind of brings the bridge for us between microevolution, which is what we studied in um, the past chapters about changes in allele frequencies, to macroevolution, which is where we see a broad change of patterns at the evolutionary um, level of a species. So um, when the allele frequencies continue to change over time, we see these huge changes in species themselves. So 22.1 is focused on the biological species concept. Um, and there's a lot of um, information that scientists take into consideration when they are identifying a species. They're going to consider their morphology. So what are their physical shape and characteristics? And also the physiology. How do they use those body parts? Um, their biochemistry, so uh, what makes up these species, and also the DNA sequences within them. The biological species concept is the most common way scientists define a species, and it states that a species is a group of population whose members are able to interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring, meaning if you cannot breed with another population successfully to produce bio, viable fertile offspring, you are two different species. Um, there is gene flow between different populations that kind of um, hold the populations together genetically, um, but if there is no more reproduction that can happen, then we have a new species. So um, it might be tempting to look at um, different organisms and say, oh, well, these guys look similar, so they must be the same species. But we know that a lot of organisms have a lot of diversity within a species. So just because they look similar on the outside doesn't mean that they're the same species. And just because they look different on the outside doesn't mean that they're not the same species. So um, this idea of the speciation concept brings it down to reproductive isolation. So this is the idea that there are certain biological barriers that prevent two species from having viable fertile offspring. Um, sometimes we can get hybrids, um, which are kind of a combo of different species, but generally those hybrids are not able to reproduce um, further. So the reproductive barriers we kind of classify into two types. We have prezygotic barriers and postzygotic barriers, which refer to does the barrier happen before the egg is fertilized or after. So prezygotic re reproductive barriers occur when members of different populations can no longer mate with each other. Um, and these are the different types of prezygotic barriers. We've got behavioral, temporal, geographic, mechanical, and gametic. Um, and these types of barriers prevent fertilization from occurring by preventing species from mating at all, or, or by preventing successful completion of the mating, or by preventing the fertilization of the egg if they do mate. So we'll go over each of these in turn. 
Um, so habitat isolation, also known as geographic isolation, is when two species d encounter each other rarely or not at all because they have different habitats. Even though they may not be physically isolated by, say, a wall or something, they live so far away that they d start to develop um, their own unique characteristics. So um, also, it could happen if there is a physical barrier. So, for example, we see these lizards here, um, and originally we started out maybe with a dark lizard, but then um, we had uh, we had some lizards migrate into the west and some lizards migrate to the east. And even though there was no physical barrier, the ones on the west started developing certain characteristics, and the ones on the East started developing certain characteristics. And then when they came back together in Southern California, they could no longer interbreed. They couldn't produce fertile offspring anymore. Uh, so rivers, mountains, oceans, etc., can contribute to this. Temporal isolation is when species breed at different times of the day, different seasons, or different years. So because their counterpart is not breeding at the same time, they cannot reproduce. Um, so, for example, the American toad and the fowler toad are definitely related species. Obviously, they're both types of toads. But um, the American toad uh, mates in the winter and the fowler toad mates in the spring. So because of that, these toads are never going to mate with each other. And that has caused them to develop into their own species. Behavioral isolation has to do with courtship and mating behavior that are unique to a specific species. So this is kind of like if there was a certain mating dance or mating song, these organisms will not mate if their behaviors are not the same, if they don't recognize them. So for example, the western meadowlark and the eastern meadowlark have very distinct songs that they sing. And so when they're mating, they will only mate with those individuals that sing the same song that they do or that recognize their particular song. Um, and so that is what is example of behavioral isolation. Um, mechanical isolation results when morphological differences prevent successful mating. So you can kind of think of this as the parts don't fit. Um, so this occurs when animals cannot mate with each other because the genitals don't fit into the right place. Um, so for example, damselflies, there's different um, species of damselfly and they all the males have different genitals shapes and those genitals don't fit into other females. So that's why they can only mate with the one. So they may be able to have intercourse in some cases, but they will not be able to um, finish the job, so to speak. Same with snails. Um, snails have a lot of uh, mechanical isolation because their shells uh, go in different directions. So if the shells don't go in the right direction, they're going to crash into each other and they won't be able to have intercourse. And then gametic isolation or gametic isolation is when the sperm of one species can't fertilize the eggs of another species. So again, this may be um, that these two species are able to have intercourse with each other, but they're not able to finish the job. It's still before we get a zygote because the sperm aren't able to fertilize those eggs. So with purple and red sea urchins, they can release egg and sperm, and those may be able to interact with each other, but neither other um, gametes can survive in the others with the other's body part. So that's another example. Those are all the prezygotic barriers. So how do we prevent, um, how do we get reproductive isolation before a zygote is formed? But we also may, in some cases, be able to form a zygote from two different species. But then there are several post zygotic barriers that prevent that zygote from developing into a viable fertile adult. So um, one example is reduced hybrid viability. So um, maybe the zygote is never able, it exists, but then it never is able to develop into an organism that's going to be birthed 
it'll um, break down before that's possible. Um, another is reduced hybrid fertility. So maybe you're able to produce a hybrid, but that organism, once it's alive, cannot reproduce and continue on this new species. And then um, finally, we have hybrid breakdown. So um, reduced hybrid viability means that we can create a hybrid, but it doesn't live to reproduce itself. It dies very young. And so salamander are an example of that. Um, and then we have reduced hybrid fertility, for example, hybrid sterility, where we get an a hybrid that's viable, it can live, but it, its offspring are sterile. So um, when we mix a horse and a donkey together, you're probably familiar with that we get a mule. But um, mules actually, because of the combination of horse and donkey, have an odd number of chromosomes. So when they are um, trying to separate, you cannot separate because the last chromosome is an odd number. And so they are not able to produce, reproduce. Um, and then finally, we have hybrid breakdown. So this is when some first generation hybrids are fertile, but then when they try to mate with another species or either of the parents, so like if um, these two tried to, to mate Maybe two hybrids can mate, but if they try to mate with other species of the parents, then the offspring of the next generation are either not living to reproductive age or they're sterile. So these are all the different types of barriers that you can have. So these first three prezygotic barriers prevent a mating attempt from happening. Um, the second two, mechanical and gametic isolation, still are prezygotic because they um, might have a mating attempt, but they prevent fertilization from happening. And then if we do get a fertilized egg, there are um, very a few different ways that there may be postzygotic barriers that prevent those from reproducing. And so only if we get viable fertile offspring are we going to see that as a species. There are some limitations to this biological species concept. Um, first, we cannot apply it to fossils, um, organisms that we find in fossils, because we don't know who they could mate with. Um, and we also can't really apply it to asexual organisms, because um, all prokaryotes that divide asexually only need themselves. So it's hard to use that definition when we don't know like, if they can just reproduce on their own. Um, also, it emphasizes the absence of gene flow. So it assumes that um, organisms couldn't move to another area and bring some new genes into the gene pool um, and allow that to kind of change the organisms over time. Um, but gene flow can occur between distinct species. For example, grizzly bears and polar bears, surprisingly, can mate to form what's known as a hybrid growler bear. Crazy. Um, there's the growler bear a little bit bigger for you. Um, so we sometimes have to use other definitions of species. So um, we could use a morphological species concept, which identifies a species based on the structural features. Um, but this is kind of subjective because you could say like, oh, we have arms and monkeys have arms. Does that mean we're the same species? So it is helpful because it can include the asexual species, but it doesn't really rely on anything genetically based. The ecological species um, concept views a species in terms of its ecological niche. So where is this species located on, on the planet Earth and what does it use in its environment? Um, so this one works for both asexual and sexual, um, but it really emphasizes the role of disruptive selection. So like those um, lizards we saw earlier where they developed the two extremes and then we have nothing in the middle. So what if we do have something in the middle? Can that be considered um, a member of which species is the problem. And then the phylogenetic species concept defines a species as the smallest group of individuals that share a common ancestor, which is a single branch on a phylogenetic tree. Um, that's kind of like the family tree of organisms. Um, and this one also works for sexual and asexual, but um, we also use a lot of things to determine how these trees are constructed.
accepted. And it can be difficult, therefore, to determine what you're going to study to make that decision and also how different do you need to be? What degree of difference do you need to have in order to be considered a different species? So that's the end of 21.1. Um, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll